home inspection training video. I'm Ben Gramico. A while back I performed a residential home inspection and took over 300 digital pictures and also shot some video of the inspection and found several major defects. We're going to go over that inspection once more and we're going to go over the actual inspection report I handed to my client. We'll review the narratives and the disclaimers. I start the inspection on the outside and I go to the roof. I bring tall ladders to the inspection, large 28, 32 foot fiberglass ladders, and I go up on the roof. You do not have to go up on any roof surface if you um, are not comfortable with it, if you're not trained, um, if you're not required by the SOP to go up on any roof structure, but I do. I do not recommend it unless you're trained. And I take digital pictures. I take a picture of every field or roof plane that there is. I take a picture along the ridge. And then I start to see pictures. This is a great one where the sun is hitting the tops of the shingles. And you can see they're starting to, they're not lying flat. They're starting to curl. There's a missing, missing shingle there. And the roof is in very poor condition. The shingles are actually cracked. And the cracks go all the way through. This isn't a, um, a crazing crack. Um, it's not a surface or a cosmetic condition. It's a functional damage. And it's not mechanical damage. It's from old age and maybe some uh, thermal expansion of the roof system. That's a great shot. And all these pictures I take to communicate to my client what the condition is. There's the cracks going all the way through cracks going through a, a shingle tab. This is a three tab shingle roof. It's um, beyond its service life expectancy, probably leaks at certain weather conditions. The cracks go not only this way through the shingle tabs, but they also go along the rafter boards. I took many pictures just so everyone is clear and that there isn't any confusion with the seller or their agent as to the condition of the roof. You're required to inspect skylights and um, the flashing along the skylight frame, the counter flashing and step flashing was in good condition, but it probably wasn't reliable because of the condition of the roof. The shingles were actually curling up and pulling up the, the flashing. Um, there's a vent stack there. I can't get to it because it's on the edge, but I zoom in and you can see that the, the flashing, the metal is rusting away. That needs to be replaced. Missing shingle tabs. And then while I'm up on the roof, I do another system. You'll find that systems overlap. While you're on the outside, on the roof, you may have a chimney stack. Do you see any defects with the chimney stack? Well, um, the picture's not all that clear, but we have flashing problems. Um, the wash or the cement top uh, is in good shape. I like to see a little bit of an overhang so that the water drips off the top. This is um, an inspection restriction. I can't see into the flue. I'm not required to see into the interior flue liner. But um, I carry a screwdriver and a, a wrench, and I pop that off, and I take a, a digital picture of the flue, just from my own record. And actually, I could see the damper. This is a fireplace um, chimney flue, and the damper door is right there. This is the defect. Uh, the step flashing is loose. This actually slid down and it's loose and it's not properly installed. There's some other loose pieces of, of step flashing. This is step flashing, this is counter flashing. And that's where it has slid from. So this is exposed, there's the chimney stack there, counter flashing, exposed edge, shingle. And this is the counter flashing where the, the top edge meets the masonry. Um, this has just been sealed. So they have a piece of aluminum, they bent it in field, and then they sealed it and fastened it with one or two fasteners. Um, this is about three feet in between the fasteners. So this was very loose. Um, I pull it out, and this is a great picture to describe the potential for water penetration down through the chimney stack flashing. Not reliable. Open the vent stacks. I take pictures of all the ventilation. We're required to inspect the ventilation methods. Uh, there's a gable vent. More cracks on another field, the lower field, chimney, I mean, um, the vent stack for the pipe. They need to be at least six inches above the roof line. If you're in a, a cold weather area where there's a snow accumulation, um, it's supposed to be at least six inches above the, the projected um, snow accumulated area. 
More step flashing. This is a critical area where the wall and the roof meet. There should be step flashing here, and the flashing goes up. Shots of the gutter, they seem to be pretty clean. There's the front porch roof, critical area here. Again, we want that flashing to extend away from the wall and overlap properly. And then when I'm on the roof, I have a digital picture camera and a video camera, and I take video of my inspections. And I just take a, a short three second video of the front of the house. The asphalt single roof is. And then I take a, a picture um, or video the of, its service life, of the. Beyond the end of its service of the roof. life, really. Uh, major damage and cracking, and it needs to be replaced. It's not it's reliable, a very poor condition. Leaks. A lot of cracks. There are many cracks through the shingles. The shingles are original to the house, 20-something years old. They probably last 25 years at most. Well, this one is um, at the end. All these cracks here just indicate it's old age. It's done its job, but it needs to be replaced now. I've been walking on the roof surface. I don't feel any major damage. So it hasn't done a lot of structural damage, but it needs to be replaced soon. And this is the main house roof, and the condition is the same on the lower secondary roof on the right side of the house. A lot of cracked shingles, actually some missing shingle tabs as well. Near the chimney stack, here's a missing shingle tab. The flashing has become loose near the chimney stack, so there's an open gap here prone to water penetration and leaking, and it's not sealed very well. Many of the cracks go right through the shingles um, along the rafter boards, just an indication of its old age and brittleness. Corners are cracked off. So every digital camera takes video. It takes um, digital pictures and video, but I separate the two. I have my right hand is my digital camera and my left hand is my video. And I really only do the roof. Sometimes I do the whole house for my clients when they're not there. And then I can burn it to a DVD and send it to them. But if they are here, nobody can get up on the roof like I can. So I take a video of it and I bring it down. And when I'm done with the inspection, I'm in the kitchen I put my chip in and I play these videos for them and they just, it's the wow factor really. And they understand the condition of the roof and can make smart decisions based upon that. And it's also, you know, the wow factor is a great marketing tool. The inspector shall inspect from ground level or eaves, the roof covering, the gutters and downspouts, the vents, flashings, skylights, chimney and other roof penetrations, and the general structure of the roof from the readily accessible panels, doors, or stairs. The inspector is not required to walk on any pitched roof surface or walk on any roof areas that appear, in the opinion of the inspector, to be unsafe. The inspector is not required to walk on any roof areas if it might, in the opinion of the inspector, cause damage. The inspector does not warrant or certify the roof. And then as I move off the roof, I'm, I'm thinking about how water moves. It goes into the gutter and downspouts. Um, it hits the side of the house, the siding, and this is vinyl siding, and we have some damage here. Probably a ball hit that. Um, that looks like a, a screw. So I'm, I'm thinking about how water moves again. Water is a destroyer of homes. Think about how water moves. Roof collects it if it's not in that poor of a shape. And uh, the gutters and the downspouts. And then grading. And then I wrap around the house, and I think about water and grading. Ideally, we want everything sloped away. And pictures help me to protect myself and to describe the inspection restrictions. We're required to inspect vegetation and how it might affect 
the house and the slope of the grating and all of the steps on the outside and the walks, these are a little loose. This is in good shape. How the slope of the yard helps protect um, the house from water penetration. And then we need to check for every area that has wood to soil contact. And this is the garage. And the garage door is hardly maintained or even uh, closely observed, unlike a front door or an entry door. So I'm always looking for where this piece of wood, and it's always in contact with the, the uh, garage floor here. And this garage floor and driveway, uh, I have a concern. I haven't been inside, but I can see that it's not properly sloped. It should be sloped and tilted so that water drains away. Again, water that hits the garage door or siding, you think about how it needs to slope away. And then there's also a bump here. Might be kind of difficult for a, a, a car or a bike to go into the garage, so I'll put that in report as a, a, an improvement. And then my client showed up, the kids, but we have some puddles in the area. Um, there was a recent rainstorm, maybe the night before it rained a little bit, so we have some depression areas. They sealed it, which is nice. And then right here, my concern would be steps. I'm always inspecting steps, thinking about how people move into the house. And this is a trip hazard here. The height is too large. So I pull out my tape measure, take a picture of it. This helps me later on also for recording. I can actually record the, the height. I don't have to remember. And then I get very detailed with my camera. And I force myself to look at places while holding a camera in detail. When you're holding a camera, um, you're forced to uh, bend down and get low to get good shots, actually. Your camera forces you to, to be more critical and careful. So I'm looking at this area again. Um, corners where different materials meet. The trim of the storm door meeting the masonry. And here's a great shot for me later on. Um, there's a bunch of things I need to pay attention to while I'm ins inspecting. Uh, the shutters, the condition of the windows, the stone exterior, how the front porch is made, what material, is it sloped properly, are there any cracks? These are wooden load-bearing posts. How do they connect to the structure? How are they connected to the top? Are there any signs of water penetration? Remember, this is the front porch roof that's in poor shape, same condition as the house roof. There's the post coming down to the concrete where wood and concrete meet. There's a concern there for wood rot. Again, that post. I don't include fences, I just do it as a courtesy, especially the gates, to make sure that they're functional. The inspector shall inspect the siding, flashing, and trim. All exterior doors, decks, stoops, steps, stairs, porches, railings, eaves, soffits, and fascias. You are required to inspect for wood in contact or near soil. You are required to inspect and describe the exterior wall covering. The inspector shall inspect and report, as in need of repair, any spacing between intermediate balusters, spindles, or rails for steps, stairways, balconies, and railings that permit the passage of an object greater than four inches in diameter. You are not required to inspect all of the windows, just a representative number. You are required to inspect the vegetation, surface drainage, and retaining walls when these are likely to adversely affect the structure. And then I go to the components. We're required to inspect the exterior siding and describe it. And so, no, so now I'm looking at the exterior and the vinyl siding here has a few problems. There is a piece of vinyl siding that has popped off. The bottom edge of the vinyl needs to be snapped back into place unless there's something like a structural panel behind the vinyl that's pushing it out. There's a, a close up shot of the vinyl. Then here I see Use the chimney as a guide for your eye, and you can see that this bulge is out. So there's a bulge in the vinyl siding. This wasn't fastened, or there's some kind of panel, again, insulation board or plywood sheathing or OSB that's pulling out. Other components. The electrical panel, uh, electrical meter, sorry. I put my hand on top of it just to show my client that I tried to move the box away from the house. Oftentimes on older homes, I find that the um, conduit has pulled the meter off of the house, and this is now loose and allowing water to penetrate. 
and the condition or integrity of the sheathing around the line going into the house is part of my inspection. And the grounding wire, I can't see where it goes, should go to a grounding rod underground. It goes into the vegetation, but I know it's installed there. Phone and cable. That's a, a sensor for the water meter. Water meter's inside the house. Um, the water meter can be read from the outside. And the dryer exhaust is there as well. And that seems to be clean. Then um, components, other components. Water faucets or hose bibs. And then there's a system. Um, air conditioner or a heat pump. I, I usually go immediately to the data plate, data plate and look to see if it's an air conditioner or a heat pump. You really can't tell. It's basically the same system. It's an outdoor condenser, air to air. And it's a heat pump, heat pump. And at a heat pump or a condenser unit, I wanna make sure that it's relatively level. It looks like the pad that was originally placed on settled. And so we don't want an air conditioner or um, outdoor condenser unit to tilt too much. So they put a piece of wood there, which is okay. I like to see masonry. The dryer filter, that's in poor shape. Um, really should be changed. This is an older unit, original to the house. It's starting to rust away. There's a service disconnect readily available. Other areas where different materials, siding, al aluminum siding or vinyl siding or wood siding meets masonry. And then this area here is usually a puddle area, but they do have downspouts with long extensions getting that water far away from the house. Another piece of loose vinyl siding. Looking here, there's another piece of loose vinyl siding. And these are all related to where the first floor meets the second floor. So there's a band joist here. And when a house ages within the first year or two, sometimes it compresses. And the siding has problems here, especially when you have um, cement stucco siding. Sometimes this area bulges out. Other components? I test these, um, all electric receptacles on the outside with, a, with few exceptions should be GFCI protected. The deck condition, the top surface looks good. Inspection restriction, I can't get underneath and this records and protects me because um, I can show that I can't get underneath the, the deck to look. I like to crawl underneath the deck and make sure that the joist hangers are uh, attached to the house securely in the ledger board. Um, this is always a concern, the bay windows where the, the siding meets the roof. Um, since this is original shingles to the house, they are old, in poor condition, same condition as the house roof, and this is a critical area always. Um, I've done a lot of water tests on these. They're hardly ever uh, water tight. And this whole bay structure, um, this siding, um, is prone to water penetration. Even the siding is in poor shape, and the aluminum capping has a lot of sealant. And this is the window, this is the window frame. This is the, the bottom of the window. And then it turns into a bunch of little pieces of flashing that are heavily sealed. So I didn't like any of this. And um, I make sure that my client understands that it's a visual inspection. I don't dismantle. And when I recommend a contractor to come in, I want them to go um, into the siding further than I can visually. They'll pull the capping off and look for wood rot. More water penetration. I'm really concerned about water all the time. Um, this is a window well. Sometimes it fills up. Try to look for water lines here or mud marks. This is an aluminum frame here. So look for maybe some uh, signs of rust or corrosion on some of the corrosive parts. Or if it's wood, this might be rotten. Try to get in there. Another hose picket. Side steps. More components. I like to take pictures of every penetration through the um, exterior siding. A bad shot, but that's a hole through the siding. Another ventilation. Gutter condition. Sidewalks are important. I want to make sure that I understand what the condition of the curb is for my client. Now we're at the thermostat. And this is the heat pump system. Down in the basement, we have a basement of this house with a heat pump system. The large line is called the watt line. And the thin line is called the watt. The large line is called the suction line, and the thin line is called the liquid line. And there is missing insulation on this line. It should be wrapped with insulation right here, energy loss right here. And for a heat pump, there is um, uh, a heater, an electric heater, a backup heater, 
when the air temperature on the outside is too cold for the condenser to absorb any energy, um, this will turn on automatically. And you can see the large electric, electric line coming in. There should be a disconnect at the heater. That's about as far as I go. Um, I don't remove this panel. There is high voltage inside here. It's very dangerous. And the um, heat pump, when it's in air conditioning mode, is producing condensate. That condensate needs to be controlled and drained. Unfortunately, they drained it into the perimeter trench. This is the concrete floor, floating slab, foundation wall, concrete foundation wall, and they just dump it here. And it really doesn't drain very well. And there's the brand new air filter. Um, it's the wrong size. Uh, it's brand new. They knew I was coming. And it, it's difficult to get out. You actually have to remove the condensate drain pipe in order to pull this out. And when you pull it out, if it's filled with water, it just gets everything wet, including the, the filter. The inspector shall inspect the heating systems using normal operating controls and describe the energy source and heating method. The inspector is not required to inspect or evaluate interiors of flues or chimneys, fire chambers, and heat exchangers. You are not required to inspect humidifiers or dehumidifiers or electronic air filters. The inspector is not required to determine the temperature, balance, size, or BTU of the system. Do not light or ignite pilot flames. The inspector shall inspect the central cooling equipment using normal operating controls. That does not include window or through wall units. The inspector is not required to determine the temperature, balance, size, or BTU of the cooling system. Hot water source, we're required to inspect all of the hot water sources. Electric hot water, there's the electric line, water shutoff, I go by component. So when I'm taking pictures, I take a picture of the system at large, and then I go in into the components. There's the electric line, the energy source, main water shutoff for the hot water source. There's the TPR valve extended to the floor. That's good. And then the laundry. This is the laundry tub. Take a picture of the system and then go in to the components. That's the motor of the pump. So the laundry tub drains into a pump and it discharges into the um, sewer line because the sewer line is higher than the drain. It can't use gravity, and there's a check valve there. And there's the discharge into the sewer line, but it's dripping. One of the valves, the hot water valve, is dripping. It's an old valve, old handle. Um, GFCI protection at the laundry receptacle, electric dryer, have hot and cold water, stainless steel hoses, discharge tube for the clothes washer and the standing pipe, that looks great. The dryer vent, I take a picture of the dryer vent, every section of it. This is a bend, shouldn't be more than 25 feet long. You subtract five feet for every bend, um, two and a half feet for every 45 degree bend, and it goes outside. If you recall, it was right next to the electric socket, meter socket. Stainless steel hoses are great instead of those um, black rubber hoses. And then I take other pictures. This is another system or component. Um, main shutoff valve, full open valve, handle is on, it's even labeled. You're required to identify those and the location of them. So there's the location. There's the water meter with the um, sensor going outside. This is the bonding wire, part of the electrical bonding system, bonding the ele electrical panel to the, the water line. Um, I like to identify the cleanout for my clients. This one is not readily accessible, and it really should be. The inspector shall inspect and determine if the water supply is public or private. You're required to verify the presence of and identify the location of the main water shutoff valve. You shall inspect the water heating equipment and verify the presence or absence of temperature pressure relief valves and or Watts 210 valves. You are required to flush the toilets and run the water in the sinks, tubs, and showers. 
you're required to inspect and describe the interior water supply, including all the fixtures and faucets, and inspect and describe the drain, waste, and vent systems. You have to inspect and describe main water and fuel shutoff valves. You shall describe any visible fuel storage systems. You are to inspect the water flow when two fixtures are operated simultaneously. You are to inspect and report mechanical drain stops that are missing or do not operate. And you are to inspect and report commodes that have cracks in the ceramic material, are improperly mounted on the floor, or have tank components that do not operate. The inspector is not required to determine the size, temperature, age, life expectancy, or adequacy of the water heater. You are not required to operate any valves, including temperature pressure relief valves. You are not required to test any shower pans, tubs, shower surrounds, or enclosures for leakage. And then while I was in there, I saw sawdust. So I figured somebody was drilling holes or something. But right there, that's an ant head, and that's an ant part. So if I look up, there's sawdust caught in spider webs with ant parts. And that's a clear indication of infestation. And um, if you're not certified or trained to do wood infestation, um, I would recommend any home inspector actually get a little bit of training so that when you see sawdust or ant parts, you can intelligently communicate to your client what you think is going on and maybe um, help them get a, a termite inspection, a certified termite inspection. Uh, electrical panel. It's 200 amps, a little trick. Two means, two fingers means 200 amps. Um, I can see all of the breakers. I like to look at all the breakers and record each one that's off so that um, I know sometimes when I pull the, the dead front cover off, I will turn off a breaker and I don't want to leave that off when it should be on. And I remove the dead front and I take a general picture of the system and then I go in and take smaller pictures of the components, the details, the lines coming in, the lugs, grounding, grounding and bonding. And other wires, there's a little out of focus, but I can see grounding wires, doubles, there's a ground and a neutral, there's a double neutral. And I also know that I don't have any scorched wiring or um, I've recorded the size, that's a 40 amp, that's a 20 amp, the size of the wiring and the size of the breaker. And if it's identified, that's the range, that's the electrical heater for the um, heat pump system. I can see if there's scorching or melting wires or damage or rust or corrosion. Pictures are great. The inspector shall inspect the service drop lateral, clearances from grade or rooftops, the drip loops, the weather heads, the meter socket enclosures, the means for disconnecting the service main, the service entrance conductors and cables, and the condition of the conductor insulation integrity the panel boards and overcurrent devices like breakers or fuses, and the service grounding and bonding. You are to inspect and describe the service disconnect amperage rating, if labeled. The inspector shall inspect a representative number of switches, light fixtures, and receptacles. You are to inspect and test all ground fault circuit interrupters, GFCIs, receptacles, and GFCI circuit breakers observed and deemed to be GFCIs during the inspection using a GFCI tester where possible. You are required to inspect and report the presence of solid conductor aluminum branch circuit wiring if readily visible. You are to inspect and report the absence of smoke detectors. You are not required to remove panel board cabinet covers or dead front covers if they are not readily accessible. The inspector is not required to insert any tool, probe, or device into the main panel board or sub-panels, distribution panels, or electrical fixtures. And then while I'm in the basement, I'm going to take pictures of all of the finished materials, the, the walls, the ceilings. There's that window we were talking about with the window well. I move a random sample of drop ceiling towels. You're not required to. I do it as a courtesy, and I also find things like I can identify where the refrigerator water supply line is for my client. I take a look at water sewer pipes as the drain pipe. 
It's a light can there above the drop ceiling and also the inspection restriction. The picture um, allows me to communicate my inspection restrictions and also um, that there's a really well insulated floor system. And I'm looking at all the wood structure too. Wooden floor joists, two by tens. Looks pretty good above the drop ceiling. Inspection restrictions. And I get my moisture meter. It's a simple probe meter. It probes the carpeting and the padding, and it tells me if it senses something like moisture. It just it does an audible sound in a light. And I probe all around, looking at the floor structure. The foundation wall looks good. I don't see any water damage, except right here. While I'm inspecting, I'm taking a lot of pictures. And it actually, for me, it forces me to look closer, I think, because um, say for this instance, if you're looking visually without a digital camera, you may not want to move in closer where this joist is and you have a structural defect. This double joist has a, um, a structural defect. This is cracked open. There's the crack there. This is the bottom of the joist and it's actually pulled away. And they tried to repair it by hitting it in with some finish nails, but that didn't work. And this is underneath the uh, fireplace, the cracked floor joist. There's the fireplace there. And there's the water that comes out of this condensate drain pipe when you take the filter out. A little nuisance. And it's just some random shots. Here's one here. And it's a dehumidifier. I re record if there's a dehumidifier in the house, especially in the basement. And I recommend to my client that they ask the seller to disclose why there is a dehumidifier. It's um, probably just a little humid down in the basement, no big deal, but sometimes it's an indication of something else that I'm not aware of because we are only in a house for a few hours, down in the basement for a few minutes. Inspection restrictions, carpeting, flooring. The inspector shall inspect the basement, the foundation, and the crawl space. You're required to inspect the visible structural components. You're required to inspect and report on the location of underfloor access openings. You're required to inspect and report any present conditions or clear indications of active water penetration observed. The inspector is required to inspect and report any general indications of foundation movement that are observed by the inspector, such as, but not limited to, sheetrock cracks, brick cracks, out of square door frames, or floor slopes. You're required to inspect and report on any cutting, notching, and boring of framing members, which may present a structural or safety concern. Test the smoke detectors. This is an old style smoke detector, hardwired, has electrical power, but no battery backup. And then I go into the attic. So I did the roof system. When I get there, I try to get there early, do the roof system, get up on the roof before anybody gets there, and then come down, do the exterior and the siding and the components, then go towards um, the most important things for my client, which is the heating and cooling system, um, electrical system, the hot water source, and the drain pipes, and the water lines, and the foundation, and look for water and structural problems. And then I go into the next important thing, which is all the way up into the attic. The rest of it is really interior in the garage. So I go by importance, I believe. And I go up into the attic. You don't need to enter the attic space if, if it's unsafe for you looking for signs of water penetration because we know that this roof covering, and I inspect the roof covering. I don't inspect the roof and system like the, um, like the small components of, of the roof system, like the truss components. I'm not an engineer. I'm just looking at the roof covering and looking for signs of water penetration. I'm not also uh, inspecting for the correct insulation according to manufacturing um, recommendations. Just looking for the insulation, fiberglass blown in insulation, Here's the chimney stack. The chimney stack is coming up here. We had that flashing problem, and there's water coming through. This is damp and wet and moldy. This is all mold down here. So there's an active water leak there. So the roof is leaking and in poor condition. And just a tip, I take a picture of the attic access, whether it's a door or stairs or, or a, a scuttle like this inside a closet, I believe. Um, it's in really poor shape. I didn't do all these holes, and I didn't do all these marks, so I take a picture of that just to record the condition that I left it in. That's how I found it. The inspector shall inspect the insulation in unfinished spaces and report on the general absence or lack of insulation in unfinished spaces.
The inspector shall inspect the ventilation of the attic spaces, but you are not required to determine the adequacy of ventilation. You are required to inspect mechanical ventilation systems. The inspector is not required to enter the attic or any unfinished spaces that are not readily accessible or where entry could cause damage or pose a safety hazard to the inspector, in his or her opinion. You are not required to move, touch, or disturb insulation or vapor retarders. You're not required to identify the composition or exact R value of the insulation material. And then you're required to flush all the toilets. So we go through, I take pictures of every component, the drain, um, the valves, the water supply lines, the shower running, it's, this is proof that I'm doing a good inspection, and then I take pictures of critical areas. At a shower, it's usually the corners where the, the, um, the glass or the plastic um, meets the bottom corners, and there's usually some kind of watermarks, and this was actually patched up, so it had leaked before. Uh, the hot and cold water was switched in that shower. Closet doors, take general pictures of the bedrooms, windows, representative number of switches, receptacles, and windows. It also shows inspection restrictions and the general condition of the, the components or systems at the time of the inspection. A lot of pictures. Again, components. This is the second floor bathroom sink. And then the skylights. If you remember, the skylights on the outside on the roof were, were in good shape, but not reliable because of the condition of the shingles lifting up the flashing. Run all the water. The doors, windows again. This is a shot of one of the registers, the floor registers. I pull it up and I take a picture inside. Um, if it's relatively clean, I even stick my hand, or relatively new house, new construction, I stick my hand inside and pull out whatever I find. I usually find sawdust and nails, stuff from construction that they just dumped inside the register. So th this is a potential um, concern for those who are sensitive to allergies. And this is the first floor, taking pictures of components and systems. There's the fireplace, and we have a defect here, um, fire hazard. This mortar joint has separated, and the hearth has settled, so it pulled away. This is an open spot for fire um, to go down in here and, and maybe cause some problems. So I recommend, actually, a professional chimney sweep to come in, make repairs, further evaluate, take a look at the flue. Don't use until that is done. Take some pictures of the hairline cracks inside as well. That's the first floor, half bath, and there's the main ground fault reset button. More components and systems. This is that bay window. On the inside, I take a picture. Uh, you have to remember that all systems kind of overlap when you're outside. You're concerned with this bay roof, and when you're inside, you have to take a picture of it, or at least inspect it, looking for water penetration problems, water, signs of water. Um, note any um, patches or new paint, some detail pictures there. And then the garage. Test the garage door opener, opens and closes. Um, the sensors are photoelectric eyes, trip them. And then we have a, a structural problem in the garage. The garage floor has settled. Uh, as you recall on the outside, when the garage door was closed, you could see that the concrete um, in the front was tilted the wrong way. Well, this entire garage floor has cracked here and has settled down here, and my clients are here helping me out do the inspection. So this is actually um, sloping the wrong way, and my hand kind of helps me um, if the floor is sloped improperly because we need to inspect floor slopes. Um, this is telling me it's sloped in the wrong direction. Garage floors need to slope towards the door to get the water out. And there's um, a GFCI protective receptacle back there. And then this is a, a great picture for me. A lot of problems happen in the garage because um, it's, it's an unoccupied space. Not a lot of people look there a lot. And water damage could occur and take place for a long period of time without anybody knowing it, especially if it's covered up with um, storage and toys and things like that during an inspection. I won't be able to see there. And then I take a picture of the firewall. Uh, walls and ceilings, we have some tape here. Not hit very well. It's starting to open up. It's a firewall breach, needs to just slapped again. And then um, some townships frown upon attic accesses through the garage ceiling. So do I. Um, this is a combustible material. It's technically a fire breach through the fire-resistant material. That needs to be hit again. Looking for 
um, bolts or anchors or foundation straps. The inspector shall open and close a representative number of doors and windows. The inspector shall inspect the walls, ceilings, steps, stairways, and railings. You shall inspect the garage doors and garage door openers by operating by remote if available. You shall inspect and report as in need of repair any installed electronic sensors that are not operable or not installed at proper heights. An inspector is not required to inspect paint, wallpaper, window treatments, or finish treatments. You are not required to move furniture, stored items, or any coverings such as carpets or rugs in order to inspect the concealed floor structure. You are not required to move drop ceiling tiles. And then I'm to the kitchen. This is the last thing that I do in the kitchen. This is where I set up my computer to print out a summary of the report. I run water at both sides, turn on the garbage disposal. Again, taking a picture of the system, and then go into detail in the components. Uh, make sure that the wire is clamped to the bottom of the garbage disposal. Turn it on. Look for leaks. There was a prior leak there. Ground fault protection on all kitchen counter receptacles and uh, I run the dishwasher too and I take a picture of the inside looking for any kind of staining or, or uh, damaged. Turn on the stove, turn on the oven, turn on the microwave, just as courtesy. It's not required. So this is my inspection report. Front page, nice picture of the house, address, date of the inspection, the time, the real estate agent's name, the client's name, table of contents. General information page um, has some specific information Recent rainfall, you should record the weather, the present weather, or if you know that it just snowed or just rained heavily, um, I always write that down. And then the temperature of the day. And then I have an article in every inspection report. Uh, the first few pages describes what really matters during a home inspection. So that it kind of focuses my client on the major things, not the cosmetic nitpicky stuff. And then I have some um, disclaimers, um, they're always in all of my inspection reports, and I'd like to read some of it to you. You're advised to seek two professional opinions and acquire estimates of repair as to any defects, comments, improvements, or recommendations that I mentioned in the report. So if I mention anything that needs to be repaired, I'm also recommending that you get at least two professionals to get estimates. We recommend that the professional making any repairs inspect the property further in order to discover and repair related problems that I didn't identify in the report. Obviously, uh, my inspection is a visual inspection only. My hands are tied. When you have a professional come in to make repairs, I want them to, let's say, just like on the outside at the bay window, I want them to tear down all of the siding there that's in question and look further because I won't be able to identify everything. We recommend that all repairs, corrections, cost estimates be completed and documented prior to closing or purchasing the property. So get things done prior to signing on the line. Um, if I tell you that something's wrong, then I expect my client to get that thing attended to or agree to accept it as is prior to closing. Don't come back and say, well, I didn't think that um, the uh, roof was in bad shape. So we waited until we purchased the house. And now, oh, I, I want to negotiate with my home inspector about making repairs to the, the roof. No. Get this done prior to closing or purchasing the property. Take action. And down here, it says, correction and further evaluation recommended. I use that phrase a lot. And it denotes a system or component that is significantly deficient or at the end of its service life and needs corrective action by a professional. We recommend the professional making any corrective action to inspect the property further, further evaluation, in order to discover and repair related problems that were not identified in the report. All corrections and evaluations must be made prior to closing or purchasing the property. We say that twice. Take action before purchasing the house. And so um, this is the page for the chimney. A lot of pictures, a lot of narratives, and I go by uh, components. So we have a chimney flashing problem. There's the chimney flue. And this is a disclaimer that we have at the top. Um, we recommend cleaning 
and a level two inspection of fireplaces and chimney flues before closing. Clean, clean chimneys do not catch on fire. So we recommend that the chimney be inspected and cleaned prior to closing, no matter what I say. And we go into the problems. There's the step flashing. Step flashing is in poor condition. Counter flashing is in poor condition. There's the chimney stack and the fireplace. There's the hearth with the crack in it. And here's the roof section of the report. It says, the first thing, we are not professional roofers. Please feel free to hire one prior to closing. <laughs> I'm not a professional roofer. I'm just a generalist, an inspector. We do our best to inspect the roof system within the time allotted. We inspect the roof covering, drainage systems, flashing, skylights, chimneys, and roof penetrations. We're not required to inspect these things. And this is a, not an exhaustive inspection of every installation detail of the roof system, according to manufacturer's specifications or construction codes. And I like this phrase. It is virtually impossible to detect a leak except as it is occurring. So I've added this because of what I've learned over the years. People call me up during the next rainstorm after they move in, and I need to somehow explain to them that it's not possible to predict future conditions. Any roof might leak, even roofs that appear to be in good condition. Um, so it's impossible, virtually impossible, to detect a leak except as it is occurring or by specific water tests, which are beyond the scope of my home inspection. We recommend that you ask the sellers to disclose information about the roof and include comprehensive roof coverage in your homeowner's insurance policy. So again, it has um, referred to the seller about the age of the, of, of the roof covering material. Um, it says, for example, I can only guess the age. I don't know exactly what the age is. I know it's in very poor condition. There's the components, estimated age, condition, flashings. Here's the exterior page. And the front, uh, the top of, uh, of the disclaimer says, water can be destructive and foster conditions that can be harmful to health. I want them to think about water. And also, I want them to know that I don't know what's going on with the property, really. Um, the sellers and occupants will have a more intimate knowledge of the site than I will have during my limited visit. Recommend asking the seller about water problems, including but not limited to water puddles in the yard, gutter or downspout problems, water penetration in the lowest level of the structure, and um, drainage systems. So I, I don't know what's underground. Drainage systems might be taking care of water problems. Um, when it rains, I'm not there when it's raining, unless I'm actually there when it's raining. And I don't have a, um, an intimate knowledge, just like the seller or the occupants would. And I want to convey that to my client. So here are some pages of the report of the exterior, exterior components, deck, steps, outdoor receptacles, faucets, dryer hood, fences and gates. There's the heat pump system, um, con condensing unit on the outside. Then I go to components, it's not level. The electrical disconnect is there, estimated age. Interior of the heat pump, component, component, electric coil, air filter, age, service record. And the service record is an awesome statement. Um, so I'll read it to you. There's no visible recent service tag on the heat pump system, possibly indicating delayed maintenance. Recommend having the heat pump system chain, uh, cleaned, inspected, and serviced by an HVAC professional. I, for every HVAC system, I look for the date of the manufacturing date to estimate the age, and also when it was last serviced. And if it wasn't serviced within a year, I tag it as a problem that needs to be corrected and further evaluated. Every HVAC system needs to be cleaned and serviced every year. And if it's not, I wanted to convey that to my client. And that has protected me a lot. And here's um, the hot water tank in the extension pipe and um, a brief explanation of the TPR valve. And if you remember, the basement was finished. And when we have a, a TPR valve on the same level as a finished room, I want a water leak catch pan because sometimes that thing will drip. Nobody's down in the basement and mold grows. So the narrative is the water heater is not equipped with a water leak catch pan, consider installing one. Um, I'm not saying it's required. I don't know the local jurisdiction, but um, I'm recommending one. A pan underneath the tank is designed to prevent or minimize water damage from a leak. The electrical panel, starting on the outside, break it down to the components, 
the meter condition, grounding outside, electric line, location of the panel, shots of the panel. And I can't get all of the pictures that I took into the report. So what I do is I grab all of the pictures off my camera and burn it to a CD and give my client um, all of the pictures and all the video. And um, the concern is, what if you take a picture of a major defect and it's not in the report and you give the picture to your client and they find out? Well, um, you're responsible for finding major defects. So um, that would be a good thing. You know, They find it for you. You really should put major defects. You should be able to put major defects, if you, especially if you took a picture of it in the report. Basement restrictions. Um, we have um, a finished wall, a finished floor, and a finished ceiling. And I like to put these narratives in because that, that protects me and also communicates my um, limitations of the inspection. The inspection of the basement is restricted by the drop ceiling tiles, limited visual access, I will lift and move a random sample of towels to inspect. One client actually expected me to um, remove all of the drop ceiling towels, and they happened to find something above one that I didn't remove. And uh, well, that's why I put this sentence in. You learn, as you learn and do inspections, you throw in narratives that protect you or communicate better. However, much of the, ceil much of the electrical wires, water, sewer pipes, heating duct pipes, floor structure cannot be seen. There may be components above the drop ceiling tiles that need improving or correcting that I cannot see. Simple, basic language. There's pictures of the floor structure, the insulation. There's the defect there at the, below the fireplace hearth. I think that's why the fireplace hearth um, fell and, and settled and made that crack because the, the floor joists below it cracked. A moisture probe. I want to make sure that my client knows I, I did as much as I can to figure out how dry the basement is. In the short time of this inspection, it is not possible to determine prior or future groundwater penetration problems. The great, great concise narratives. And the garage door opener, um, the slab has a structural problem. There's the laundry components, laundry system, this whole, these two pages of laundry system, then components. The dryer vent uh, hasn't been cleaned. Um, the water supply hoses, the laundry tub has a pump, um, the handle is leaking, electric receptacles, the outlet for the dryer, and no water catch pan. And then here's the shot of the um, attic space. You don't have to enter the attic space, but if you do enter it, I, I tell them, I inspect the attic space by entering it, but there's no flooring, and the insulation is covering the joists. I am unable to safely move all around the attic space completely, so there are inspection restrictions and identify the material, try to get a, an estimated thickness. It was only eight inches. There's the master bathroom. There are no access panels for the tub or the shower. There's no plumbing access panel for the shower. Um, I like to have plumbing access panels installed. And in some townships, it's not required. Some new construction, it is required for every fixture. So you can get in there, for, especially for showers. I want to see underneath the shower where the connection is to the floor uh, between the floor of the shower and the drainage pipe. And here's the kitchen. Kitchen pages. Break it down into components, kitchen faucet, garbage disposal, GFCIs, the dishwasher, electric top, oven, exhaust fan, and microwave. And then the interior. Everything's good in the interior, except one thing down in the basement. If you recall, the basement had a finished section, section, and the only way out of there in an emergency is up the stairs. The windows were very small and really high up on the foundation wall. So I put this little narrative. There's a basement with a habitable, habitable space, and there's apparently no emergency escape and rescue opening to the outside. Today's building standards require an opening from the finished basement room to the outside. This standard may be applied at this property. I don't know if it's going to be applied. I've heard some townships come in, and if the basement hasn't been registered with the township, with the building permit, they force it all out. You gotta tear it all out, and then if you're gonna put it back in, you need an egress. So a potentially hazardous situation exists with an opening. I'm not saying it has to be installed or requiring anything. I use a lot of maze, maybe applied at this property, and a lot of recommendations. And then I describe what an emergency escape and egress standard is. And then I also recommend 
um, including in your report, in your home inspection report, the standards of practice that you follow. Uh, this internet standards of practice is really long. You can abbreviate it and put it in. I'm not sure what the legal ramifications of abbreviating a standards of practice is and putting it in the report, but it's actually helped me a lot. I've actually come back to properties where there has been a problem after the inspection, and I have the report, and the abbreviated standards of practice are numbered in the report. It's included with the report, so there's no way that they can get around it like uh, I didn't read it, because they agree that they read the entire inspection. And then I actually use a highlighter and highlight the standards of practice, those lines that help protect me. So I recommend putting some type of standards of practice in your report. Probably the entire standard would be a good idea, but I have it abbreviated. And then I throw some illustrations in there. And this is one of the last pages, report conclusion and walkthrough. So the report conclusion goes, we're proud of our service and trust that you will be happy with the quality of our report. We've made every effort to provide you with an accurate assessment of the condition of the property and its components and to alert you to any significant defects or ad adverse conditions. However, we may, you explain what you're doing and then what could happen. However, we may not have tested every outlet and opened every window and door, not required to, or identified every problem. Also, because our inspection is essentially visual, latent defects could exist. So there could be problems. You could buy a house, get an inspection, and there still could be problems with that place. And this is what we're trying to describe, because we can't see behind walls. Therefore, you should not regard our inspection as a guarantee or warranty. It is simply a report on the general condition of our property at a given point in time. As a homeowner, you should expect problems to occur. Roofs leak. Basements may have water problems, and systems may fail without warning. We cannot predict future events. For these reasons, you should keep a comprehensive insurance policy current. And also, it has a, a pre-closing statement. A pre-closing walkthrough. Um, in Pennsylvania, you had this chance, had this opportunity, just before you signed on the dotted line, to go through the house one more time. And I realized that this was my client's last chance to see problems. And if there were problems, to take action upon it. Many of my clients didn't. They found the problem. There was um, a severe change in the weather and water came in or something leaked while the, the, uh, the um, occupant or the seller was moving out. The front door was damaged by the, the movers moving out the furniture or something like that. And they had that walkthrough, that pre-closing walkthrough. They found the problem but they didn't take action on it. And so I, I wanted to add this narrative to my report. Every report has this, telling my client to take action if they see a defect prior to closing or purchasing the problem. Any defect or problem discovered during the walkthrough should be negotiated with the seller or owner of the property prior to closing. Purchasing the property with a known defect or problem releases me of all responsibility. Client assumes responsibility for all known defects after settlement. And then I list at least 10 things that my client should do during that pre-closing walkthrough. And one of them is recommend hiring me again to help them. So another piece of um, paper that comes out of my printer while I'm printing the report at the end is a letter to the homeowner or seller. And it describes what we did during the inspection and that we, um, we tried to put everything back the way they had it. And uh, we preempt by apologizing if we didn't do that. So we understand that a home inspection can be a stressful process, a little empathy there. During our inspection, we make every effort to respect your home and leave it as we find it. I never walk in with my outdoor shoes into the house. I always change them. You can get um, little uh, covers for your feet or I change them into different shoes. That's one indication of, uh, and you can actually take a picture of your, your feet going through the house. It's one way to respect other people's properties. All the um, inspectors of our company bring clean shoes that are worn indoors only. During the inspection, we look over 500 different items, some which need to be tested, open and closed, and turned off and on. We try to put those back to their original setting or condition, but some items may, be, may have been overlooked. And here's a list of some of the things you want to check and make sure they're back as they were prior to the inspection. There's a little list there. And we're always trying to improve our company. Um, if you have any comments or recommendations, we welcome them.